When it comes to a good book, uh, three things that are important. Location, location, location. I think that's a real estate show on the telly, isn't it? But having a setting for a book, having a place where the characters interact with the various plot points sometimes can be as important, or in some cases perhaps even more important, than the characters and the plot themselves. In some books, perhaps the location becomes a character. Joining me on the program now, our literary correspondent, Elizabeth Kirkby McLeod. Kia ora, thank you for your time today. No problem, Andrew. Nice to join you. That uh, sense of, of place, that sense of being connected with the whenua, the, uh, the uh, place that we get transported to in our minds and imaginations as we read this tale. Uh, this is, I mean, particularly when done well, this can make or break a book uh, and, and make it more of an immersive experience for the reader. Yes, it's interesting you use that word whenua, right? Because yeah. this idea that um, people are made by the place they live is quite yeah. ancient. But I think because of the globalised society we live in now, we've sort of forgotten about how much our place shapes us. And I think books is a good way where we can see the place actually creating and affecting the characters and again, in this globalised world, I've noticed a tendency of some books to, to just place their setting anywhere, somewhere generic, somewhere yeah. global, you know, so that thinking, oh, well, then a reader in New York and a reader in Tokyo and a reader in Wellington will all feel like it's their city. But I don't think that that really works. I think you miss a lot by not really grounding it in a specific location. And I think there's three main ways that um, place can affect characters. Should we, should we talk about those? Let's jump into those. Sounds good. Well, the first one is psychologically. And I was thinking here about The Dry by Jane Harper. Now, this is a suspense thriller mystery kind of a book, mm -hmm. but it's in, in a small Australian town, farming town, and it, where it hasn't rained for a long time. Yeah. And that creates almost, the character is almost uh, lawless in itself, right? It's not following the laws of nature. It's not raining when it should. And it's creating this real sense of everyone being on edge, nature is on edge, fire could happen at any moment. And that affects how the characters are. There is a sense of lawlessness to the whole town, the sense mm -hmm. that everything is just on edge. Everybody is is on the edge of what they can cope with. And that comes actually from that setting. I think if you want a lush pasture land, you would have to create that sense through yeah. a different way. Yeah, no, totally. And, and that uh, not just the setting, but the circumstances uh, affects the motivation of, of the characters. I mean, you want the the location to be accessible to people that have been, never been there, and that's I, particularly the case, I'm, I'm thinking of, a, of another example, if we go uh, deep into science fiction, for example, another very dry place, uh, the planet Arrakis or June. It's a big uh, blockbuster film at the moment, but of course before that it was a series of books creating this immersive world in a total fantasy session. This is an extra challenge uh, for an author to take us to a place that doesn't exist and yet make us feel like we're there. Yes, and in fact, that's another way in which place can affect characters is actually, you see that a lot in June, is it physically, right? The way in which they can travel, the way in which they can breathe, the way in which the clothes that they have to wear, they're physically being created and affected by this sand planet. Yeah. Another way, or symbolically, um, and again in the world of fantasy, if you think about Lion, Witch and the Wardrobe, the fact okay. that it was always winter but never Christmas mm. is such important part of the beginning of that book and is actually what the first change that we see, the first effect we see of Asland in the nation is the change in winter, right? Yeah. The fact and Santa Claus shows up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and with that becomes, I suppose, the hope that things can be different. And, I mean, quite a contrast with the, the first book that you mentioned, The Dry, where you've got this sort of this brokenness and this, this lack of, of, of hope in that regard. I mean, talking about uh, fictional stories in that regard, but but also, I mean, is there a sense where, look, if you're writing about a place, if, you're, um, if your story is set in, um, in Taranaki, for example, then gosh, you'd better sp you've better spent some time in Taranaki. You need to know the land. You need to know what the mist looks like uh, in an early autumn morning. You need to have a sense of, of what that feels like. So if you... Uh, yes, you're transporting readers that have never been there to that experience, but for people who go, yes, I know what that's like, I suppose they, they, they can identify with that as being an authentic recreation of what that place is like? 
Yes, so definitely I think there is richness added if you're writing about a place you know. And writers will, if they can, travel to places to to get that. Uh, Some people have um, can't afford a travel budget. Some writers will tell me even that just like opening Google Earth and kind of like kind of getting a sense of the streets. But of course you miss out on some of the senses that way, don't you? It's not just about what you see in a place, but what you hear and feel and touch and smell. Smell and taste. Um, I I mean, John Grisham, a very good example of this. And look, I mean, he's got the travel budget, obviously, very successful author. And I don't know, maybe he just got sick of writing courtroom dramas set in the southern states of America. Uh, But there was a couple of books, I think, where he thought, you know what? My story is going to be set in a cool part of Italy that I love, and I'm just going to live there for 18 months and just eat some great Italian food. Is that, I mean, he can get away with it. He's a successful author. And I, honestly, I read the book. It was quite interesting. Uh, but is that is that a little bit of a, um, of a cheat? You know, this is just saying, well, I just want to go to Italy. I'm going to use this book as an excuse to do so. Not at all. I mean, Nikki Pellegrino is a New Zealand author that does that. She yeah. travels. Um, and spends time in a place in Italy, enjoys the food, and then, you know, that becomes where she chooses to set her book. I think it's important, though, that as authors, we, how our character describes a place shows us, should show us something about them, yes. not necessarily about us and all the research that we've just done for the last 18 months living in Italy. Uh, so, for example, if your character is an accountant or your character is a painter, mm. how are they going to describe the things they're going to notice about a place? Mm. Are going to different and they need to be true to those characters not just true to what you as an author have collected in your journals while you've been on holiday <laughs> yeah I, I think the um the john grisham book he, he had the hack of uh, his main character was somebody who had fled to italy and was experiencing as an outsider and some some loving descriptions of the food that this character was eating i think john that's just what you had for lunch but, uh, but there we go. Hey, just wanting to, to circle back to something that we started with, talking about, I suppose, the whenua and, uh, and books for us that are set in New Zealand. And now this is the opposite of what you're talking about before, where there's a, kind of this generic town that could be anywhere that all of us can relate to. I suppose the importance of, as New Zealand authors, being deeply rooted into the soil in which we're from. As, as people of this land, this land has shaped us, having uh, books or series of books that that share that experience that not only New Zealand uh, uh, audiences, New Zealand readers can identify with, but that represents a little bit of uh, Aotearoa to people on an international stage, perhaps? Yeah, so I think New Zealand authors at times have shied away from this. They've thought, oh, I can't set my book in New Zealand because nobody cares, you know, nobody yeah. wants to know. But interestingly, when you look at the books from New Zealand that have been major international breakthroughs, they've actually been really deeply rooted. And the one I can think of is The Luminaries, for example, oh, yeah. by Eleanor. And that's set in the gold rush in the West Coast where it's raining all the time. Yeah. Um, muddy, all the dresses and clothes always getting caked in mud. Um, you know, it's very specific place. And, and those actually are the books that... Um, that I find do well internationally. I think that um, it shouldn't be seen as, oh, nobody cares about my little corner of the world. Mm. I think only you can write about your little corner of the world. Yeah, yeah. And, and hey, Luminaries is an example. Uh, I Honestly, I've thought, gosh, wouldn't that be a great book to read? But you do need a run-up. Uh, and possibly a slide rule and and a notebook to to keep note of all the characters and what their the phase of the moon is and all that type. It is a complicated book, but I always thought the best place to read the luminaries would be in Hokitika or perhaps even in Shantytown, just up the road from Hokitika, to put yourself in the setting that the characters are in to read the book. Are we sort of completing the circle there when it comes to location of, I mean, hey, let's all go to Italy to read John Grisham if we could, uh, but but at least hook a ticket to, to read the luminaries. I mean, maybe not this week. I think some roads are closed, but you get the idea, right? <laughs> yes. In fact, I bought Anne of Green Gables to Prince Edward Island with me. Oh, wow. And with- Boy, even had children, and me and my husband spent every evening in the tent at Prince Edward Island reading at reading Anne of Green Gables out loud. You know, wow. <laughs> like it's it's really cool to go to a place which um, is the setting of a book that you've loved all your life. It's pretty. It's a pretty cool experience. Another one I can think of is um, I would love to go to Guernsey. Oh, I know yeah. nothing about Guernsey. I know nothing more about Guernsey except for what I learned about in the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society book. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
made me want to go there and just like I said no other knowledge no other experience but I want to go and that's the place where I'll be reading that taking that book and reading it out loud as well that sounds like a very good idea indeed and and hey you know, maybe uh, a combination of love of literature with love of travel and, and hey, let's write some more uh, wonderful books set in New Zealand to encourage our travel industry and, and et cetera. Hey, this has been a fascinating conversation on the topic of location in literature. Elizabeth, thank you so much for the work that you do and for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you so much, Andrew. Hey, thanks very much for joining us in the Rima studio. Thanks very much for watching the interview. It's kind of nice to have an audience, actually. And if you did like what you watched, then do give us a like, do give us the thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more interviews like that one, or perhaps even better, subscribe and those interviews will come straight to you. Don't forget to turn on your notifications and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.